we're on part four of developmental psychology where we talk about adolescence, which is kind of what you are right now. You're an adolescent. So here we go. What is it? It's uh, kind of a newer age group that was made most popular by G. Stanley Hall in about 1904, so right around the turn of the century. Uh, so a little quick history of like children and growing up. In the, uh, from about 1790 to 1840, children began working in factories, right? We have the Industrial Revolution, children are working in factories. In 1932, 40% of children who lived in uh, New England were working, or 40% of workers in New England were children, rather. So we have a lot of children working, and they're working in long hours. We're talking like 18 hours a day, anywhere from 10 to 18 hours a day. So we're talking a lot. So children basically, you know, they were a child, then they started working. There was no, like, middle period. Um, from about 1840 to 1900, some of those kids stopped working in the factories and weren't allowed, and we had this th thing called compulsory education, which is what you're doing. You have to go to school. It's required. Um, they, one of the reasons why we had compulsory education was to give those kids who used to work in factories a place to go, someone, something to do. Um, because if not, mom and dad are working, these but a bunch of kids now who are living in cities, right? Remember the United States before the Industrial Revolution was mostly rural, which means they lived out in the country on a farm. Now they're living in cities, and in cities there's nobody to take care of them because the parents are working, so you have this compulsory education. So you start to have to see kids in school uh, the last part of the 1800s. And then from about 1900 to present, right, from, we said 1904, G. Stanley Hall um, made this popular, Ad adolescence became a distinct stage, right? This is the, the middle period between when you're a child and when you're a, an adult. And it's this, it's a sort of a new period, right? Before that, you were just a kid. You were just, uh, you know, the, what a kid was was like a miniature adult, right? And so you were just this kid. You kind of grew up and you became this adult. And... Um, you weren't really seeing, there wasn't any real middle period. And now today we kind of acknowledge this adolescent period. Uh, in fact, uh, adolescence now is like extend even longer now. Some people are saying that uh, college now is extending adolescence. So like you don't really grow up and become an adult until after college. And you know, with the rise of uh, college students who come home to live with their parents after they graduate from college and we're talking, uh, you know, there's probably some reality to this. Okay, so we have adolescence. Adolescence occurs right around the time that we have puberty. Puberty is just when you start to develop sexually. All right, girls have their period, which is called, the first one's called menarche. I don't know why it's got that silly name, but that's the first one. And boys um, mature sexually. Their voice deepens. They get more testosterone. They start growing hair. And uh, that's when they're entering puberty, right? Their voice kind of changes, you know. That's why you, in your higher, you hear their, their squeaky voice, like that, uh, when they're talking. Um, part of this is, uh, part of what separates boys and girls is these primary and secondary sex characteristics. Those kind of show themselves more as you're in adolescence and puberty. A primary sex characteristic is something that definitively makes you a boy or a girl. So, Either your penis or your vagina. That's it. You got one of those two, you're a boy or you're a girl, right? That's such a primary. That's, that's the thing right there that tells you what's what. Uh, secondary sex characteristic is something that uh, is not essential to being a boy or a girl, but is a result usually of being that. So girls tend to have wider hips. That's a secondary sex characteristic. Women have boobs, bigger boobs. Those are secondary sex characteristics. Men have hair, more hair. Uh, deeper voice, secondary sex characteristics. So these are things that happen to men and women as a result of either estrogen or testosterone usually, but aren't essential to them being a man or a woman. If somebody didn't have big boobs, it doesn't mean they're not a woman. If somebody doesn't have a deep, uh, hair on their chest, it doesn't mean they're not a man, right? So it's just something that's secondary. Primary, though, tells you exactly what's what. All right, so as we move on here in adolescence, uh, we develop these stages of morality. This guy right here, Lawrence Kohlberg, um, has actually three like levels of morality and he actually had six stages. Each level had two uh, stages in it. Um, the first two, first two would fall in this level of pre-conventional and uh, level one's got this stage one's called obedience and then stage two is uh, self-interest. 
interest. Um, obedience is basically this, your level of morality. So morality is kind of how we look at the world, how ethically we look at the world or what our morals are. Obedience is, am I going to get punished, punished for this or not? If I'm not, I can do it. If I don't, if I am going to get punished, I shouldn't do it. So that's the level of morality of some, you know, a lot of kids, right? They do things because they want to. If they know they're going to get punished, they don't do them. It's that simple. Second is self-interest. Um, so stage two is self-interest. That's still pre-conventional, right? This is where it's the what's in it for me um, and paying for a benefit. So they might do something um, even and they might get punished, but if it's self-interest, they might still do it. So the level of morality is looking out for number one. Um, and again, this is kid stuff, right? Um, this, the second level, so this is like level, this is the first one. The second level is conventional, which has stage three and four. Stage three is uh, basically conformity. All right, uh, social norms. So, so third level of morality, you basically follow social norms, right? So what's the norm? What's acceptable in the society? You follow those things. You don't really question it too much. You just follow it because that's what everybody else does. Um, four is authority and social order. So this one is you follow the law. It's kind of, I mean, I say blindly, but it's not because you're not bad if you follow the laws blindly. You don't really question them. It's just you follow the law. The law is there. Whatever the law is, it must be good. So you follow it. You don't think too much about it. You don't try to think of, you know, if it's hurting anybody, it's just the law. So the law must be good because it's the law and um, you follow it, okay? Post-conventional, some people never reach this. Post-conventional morality is, you know, not necessary. Some people, a lot of people are stuck right here, level two, right? Uh, Self-interest their entire life. Conformity in four, you know, this is a little bit more advanced. Most adolescents are actually in one of these two stages or maybe up here in four. Um, this oftentimes, you know, this is a stage that's not essential. People don't always reach this stage uh, of post-conventional. And post-conventional is uh, contains of stage five, which is a social contract. And come on now. And stage six, which is a universal ethical principles. Come on. Ethical principles. Um, so these two are, you know, principle of conscious. So social contract is, well, everybody's got these rules, these social norms, but there's different norms in the world, right? So my laws might not necessarily be the right laws for you if in your particular situation. So it takes into account other people's views and their situations and not everybody's laws may be the same, right? Um, Universal ethical principle is, hey, there's this higher order here, and I'm only going to follow a law if it's ethical. If it's, this is the right thing to do, then this law is just, and I'm going to follow it, and it's something I can believe in. If it's not just, and you start to think about these abstract, higher level things um, with, your, um, with your thinking. All right. Uh, he formed this in the early 80s, and this is definitely, we talk about, right, stage versus continuity. In, this is definitely a stage, right? This is this is definitely a stage theory, right? This is ladders of a rung. You go to one, from one to the next, and you usually don't go backwards too much. Usually, once you get to one, you you stay there, and move on. Okay. Um, then we've got Erickson's stages. He's got eight stages of psychosocial development, right? Erickson was a follower or a contemporary of Freud. Actually, he's right after Freud, but he, you know, he followed his footsteps. And so he has eight stages, as we'll see later with Freud. Freud also has eight stages of development. Um, so let's go through these rather quickly. Um, stage one is trust to mistrust. This usually occurs between zero and one year old. Um, if your needs, and so basically if, if something goes on here, is, is satisfied here, you get to move on to the next stage. If you get this satisfied, you get to move on to the next stage. If at any point, on these stages, you have problem, 
this is a sticking point. You're going to face that problem the rest of your life. And so that's what Erickson would say, you know, it gets stuck on. This uh, stages of psychosocial development isn't necessarily um, a very well received today uh, levels of stages. It's kind of looked on, yeah, this is okay, this is nice, but nobody really follows it uh, to the letter and says, you know, this is what stage you are. I know you have problems with initiative and guilt and you're going to, you know, this is why you're acting this way. Nobody really does that anymore. But it's a nice kind of a framework. It's older. It's been around. And so we, we tend to go over it. Um, so if trust versus mistrust, if your needs are dependably met, you know, that first year of life from zero to one, you're going to develop a basic set of trust, right? Because you're trusting at that age for your caretaker to take care of you. So uh, if your basic needs are met, check, you get to move on. All right. And you're going to live a so far so good. All right. From about one to three is autonomy versus shame. You know, this is the toddler areas. Um, toddlers learn to do things for themselves. They start to adopt their ability to do things. And so if they're able to learn to do things for themselves and, you know, have a, reach a little bit of success, then they're going to get to move on. If they aren't able to do things and continually fail, then they're not. And you're going to be stuck here, okay? So you uh, might and you'll be shamed and you're going to have that problem the rest of your life, uh, according to Erickson. So, you know, you check... You're able to do things. You move on to initiative versus guilt, which is about three to six. This is your preschool years, right? Um, they carry out plans, but they oftentimes feel guilty about being independent from uh, their caretakers and whatnot. In um, <clears throat> stage four, uh, an industry versus inferiority. This is from about six to puberty, right? And puberty can happen. It usually happens uh, earlier in girls, but it can happen anywhere now, you know, from 11, 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, somewhere in that range uh, when you start to develop sexually, remember? Um, and this is where children learn the pleasure of applying themselves to tasks. So industry, that's what in industry is, industri industrious, or they feel inferior if they're not able to do that, okay? Again, meet that... Oh, it's the over part, so let me pause this. Did you guys hear that? The over part song, so they want to see it. The movie's over. Uh, I'll be back. All right, while it was over, so uh, we had to do something about that. We're now watching up for a couple minutes until I'm done here. Then we're going to bed. So uh, here we go, finishing up. We got stage five here, identity versus confusion. This is from your teen years, you guys, right now, all the way into your 20s. You are in this stage, identity versus confusion. So Erickson says, right now, you're working on refining a sense of self by testing your roles and integrating them to form an identity. So you basically, what that's saying is you're trying to find out who you are. So you're testing stuff out, you're changing, and you're deciding, who am I? Um, if you're not able to do that, you become confused about who you are. And if you never really figure out between sometime between now and into your early 20s, if you don't know who you are, you're going to have a problem. So figure out who you are, what you want to be. Uh, or Erickson is going to say you're going to be in, uh, in trouble. Okay? After that, right? So after you've figured out who you are, you're going to move to stage 6. Into me versus isolation. Intimacy versus isolation. This is your 20s to your 40s, and um, you're struggling to form relationships, and you want to gain the capacity for intimate love, and if you don't, you're going to feel isolated. So you're looking for this intimacy. If you don't, you're going to feel isolated. Again, so you're looking, right? This is, so Erickson, remember when Erickson lives in your 20s, if you're not, that basically means you don't get married. If you don't find that special someone, you're screwed. So Erickson, find somebody in your 20s or 40s, according to Erickson. Um, Stage seven, we're nearing the end of our lives now. Generativity, actually not the ends. I shouldn't say that, but we're past midlife now. 40s to 60s. Um, in your middle age, you want to have this sense of generativity. So you're being generous. You're contributing to the world. Or are you just not doing anything? Are you stagnant? Stagnant means just kind of stuck. So what are you? Do you are you doing something? Are you being a positive force in the world? Or are you stuck doing nothing? And then finally... 60s and up, 
you're in this stage called integrity versus despair. This is where you look back at your life and you say, okay, did I live my life with integrity? Did I have, do I have something to be proud of? Do I have something, you know, to pass on to my grandchildren and my children and they're going to think uh, I was a decent person? Or if I didn't, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel this sense of despair. Like, I don't have any time left. I'm screwed. I've wasted my life. And you're going to die unhappy. So, again, these are all Erickson stages. Um, they match up with Freud stages in that there's eight. They generally occur around the same ages. But they're not, you know, hard and fast, and this is what everybody believes. This is uh, something that we need to know about, and we're, we use it as kind of a reference, but we don't use it as a hard and fast uh, decider of what's going on in your life. All right, so that's about it, and we'll see you next time.